This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Tonight on Unsolved Mysteries, journey into the shadowy world of dreams and hear the startling accounts of three people who were convinced that their dreams predicted the future. In New Orleans, a brutal serial killer has apparently taken the lives of several young women. Police need your help before he strikes again. And an intriguing profile of a devious Con Juan who preys upon lonely women, taking first their hearts and then their wallets. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. dream so vivid you thought it was real, so compelling you wondered if it actually happened. As fantastic as it may seem, you're about to meet several people who are convinced that sometimes dreams do come true. Glenn Loney is a professor of theater at Brooklyn College in New York City. His story begins on a cold winter night 20 years ago when he had a dream which he believes saved his life. I was driving up a hill, and there was a blind curve up at the top. It was like the road was built sort of around a hillside. On my side, the outside lane, there's really a very steep drop. Suddenly, there came a car around the curve. There's a little two-wheel trailer behind it, and suddenly the outside wheel of the trailer comes off, and there was a shower of sparks like a sparkler and suddenly the wheel came skidding across the road toward my car, and I thought, step on the gas or you're a dead man. <laughs> and I woke up in a cold sweat. I never had a dream that I remembered every particular detail of, and it was so vivid as if it had actually happened. I mean, other dreams aren't like that. Other dreams are bits and pieces of things from the real world and from the world of fantasy and things that never were or never could be. This was just like seeing the thing that somebody else had filmed it. That there might have been a camera in the back seat. Six months later, Glenn was on a business trip with a fellow professor in a part of the country where he had never been before. How's your classes going, by the way? Oh, doing fine. Good. Yeah, we got some good people this time. Mm -hmm. Halfway up, I realized this is the hill of my dream. I suddenly realized this is the road, this is the place. There was no traffic coming the other way, nothing. You all right, Glenn? No, I'm not. I said, my God, a car's going to come around that curve, and a wheel's going to come off the trailer, and it's going to come out of our car. I've got to step on the gas, or we're dead. Some would say that what happened to Glenn Loney was mere coincidence. However, there are many people who believe that what he experienced was a phenomenon known as a psychic dream, a dream which can apparently foretell the future. There's a clear distinction between ordinary dreaming, which we all do every night, and a psychic dream. And the clear distinction is that for ordinary dreams, they're very difficult to remember. Five minutes, 10 minutes after you're awake, you forgot most of the details. It's very hazy. On the other hand, a psychic dream wakes you bolt upright out of bed. It's a clear, vivid dream 
that literally shocks you awake. So what I'll do is I'll go through all of these. Dr. David Ryback is one of the leading authorities on psychic dreams. He and freelance author Letitia Schweitzer have written a book which contains more than 80 case studies. Dr. Ryback has concluded that perhaps one out of 12 people have experienced psychic dreams. Here's one from Houston. When I first realized that um, I had the ability to see into the future through my dreams was when I was a teenager. Rhonda Anderson is one of the subjects in Dr. Ryback's study. But I do remember just having glimpses into the future through my dreams. Um, over here there's uh, Greek. In 1980, Rhonda was living in Knoxville, Tennessee when she began dating Joe Anderson, a man she would later marry. The first test of their relationship came when Rhonda told Joe about her special ability. For me to believe something like that, I would probably have to have uh, been involved in it or, 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 or know specifically of the incident. Uh, I typically don't believe things like that, that uh, uh, without uh, you know, having some proof. Six months after Joe and Rhonda met, Joe got the proof he needed. While he was away on a weekend camping trip, Rhonda dreamed that he had an uninvited intruder at his campsite. My heart was pounding so hard that I had to sit up in my bed and I looked at the clock and it was three o'clock in the morning. And I knew that there was really not anything that I could do about it at that time. Hello? Hi, honey, how you doing? Oh, Joe, I'm so glad you called. Is everything all right? The next morning, Joe called Rhonda as soon as he returned home. She had not been expecting me until uh, later that afternoon. And then she asked me what I was doing back so early. I told her we had had an incident with a bear and decided to leave, come back home early. Joe says at around 4 o'clock that morning, he awoke when he sensed a disturbance outside of his tent. He was certain of the time because he checked his watch. She'd had the dream about 3 o'clock since I actually saw the bear after the bear had uh, gotten into camp and torn things up. It must have been about the time that the bear had come into camp the first time. It occurred to me, you know, possibly it was a, just a coincidence, but actually thinking back on it, uh, the fact that she had the dream while the uh, situation was occurring and uh, uh, the way she described it was very similar to the way it actually occurred, uh, I felt like it was been a very unusual coincidence. About a year later, Joe and Rhonda were married, and Joe received another surprise. His new stepdaughter, Roxanne, also claimed to have psychic dreams. Researchers believe the ability can be passed from generation to generation. We do have cases where families have, have psychic dreams very often. The mother may have it. Uh, in one family, we know the mother dreamed psychic dreams, the son did, and all of the first cousins. And they were even raised in different environments because each of the members had been adopted when the family split up. It's hard to know whether there's a hereditary factor or not. Uh, clearly, some families have two or three people in the family who not only have psychic dreams, but have the same psychic dreams, which is a really astounding event. Rhonda and Roxanne have had just that experience. In April of 1991, Rhonda dreamed that Joe was in a terrible accident, but did not tell anyone in her family. A week later, Roxanne says she had the very same dream. Our car was on the side of the road, and then I saw a glimpse of Joe, his head, his face, and then I saw the police writing a police report. It was really, really disturbing to me. It, it really upset me because it just, you know, it, it scared me and it felt like it was something that was gonna happen. And I said, well, Roxanne, I said, let's just think positively about it and let's just pray that everything will be okay. And from then on, I would just ask Joe to please be careful. 
Two weeks later, Joe was on his way to the mountains for another weekend of camping when he momentarily took his eyes off the road. Luckily, I wasn't injured. Of course, the first thing I thought about after that happened was that uh, Ron did warn me to be very careful, and uh, I had uh, not paid attention to the road and uh, slid off and had the accident. The, the car crash could have been more detrimental. It could have been more disastrous. And I, hung, I hang on to the thought that perhaps maybe that was the reason that I had the dream and Roxanne had the dream so that we could warn him over and over again to please be careful. Because had we not, we don't know what would have happened. The extraordinary experiences of the Anderson family could make even the harshest skeptics stop and think. After all, coincidence can only account for so much. You're about to meet a woman who says her psychic dreams did not foretell the future, but brought her news of an untimely death. Joe, I'm so glad you're back. It's so good to see you. Katie, okay, it's really great to be back. In 1942, 20-year-old Catherine Webb fell in love with a soldier named Joe Stewart. I don't think it's really the best time for us to go into a marriage. Both wanted to marry, but because of hardships in their families, they decided that the timing was not right. Well, you know, the truth is, Joe, I've, I've been thinking the same thing. Mother's not well. Dad's not very strong. I just don't think it's fair to you to take on that much responsibility. Yes, I've always regretted that. Instead of being so conscientious about our obligations, we should have thought of ourselves. I didn't see him for a while, and then I saw him again. And from then on through the years, when I'd see him, we'd, we'd go out two or three times. But I left it go at that. Catherine never forgot her first love. She remained single until January of 1965, when at the age of 47, she married her next door neighbor. The next year, Catherine began having a strange recurring dream. I kept getting this dream all the time. All I saw was these nurses and doctors, a lot of confusion, probably working on someone. That was, would be how it would look. The nurses were rushing around. The doctors seemed very concerned, but I, I couldn't see what they were doing. And then it seemed to me that I just got the intuition that it's about Joe Stewart. And I guess kept having that dream off and on, all during the month of May and June, and it just got worse and worse. Finally, Catherine had a dream which seemed to explain everything. In this new dream, Catherine was in her kitchen when she received a most unexpected visitor. I turned around and Joe was standing there. Joe? What are you doing here? Kate, I came to tell you that I died. What? Yes, it's true. I'm dead. It seemed quite natural for him to have a hold of my hand and take me. I, I, you know, I believed him. I just couldn't grasp it. Joe, I don't understand this. I'll explain. You see, I just had to let you know that, thanks to your prayers, I'll have a Christian burial. It's all right. Who is this? It's me, Kate. I could smell flowers and fern, and I looked down at the man in the casket. No. It didn't look like Joe. It isn't you. It doesn't look like you. Yes, I know, but it is. And I came to tell you that I'll always love you. And I could feel the flesh and the warmth of his hand. And he said, I always loved you. And he kissed me. And I felt his lips and his breath. And that was it.
my perspiration was pouring off of me. I was shaking. I thought, now I know why all those dreams I saw of doctors and nurses, and I thought it was Joe, this is what it meant. What I just saw was no dream. This was a vision, and I knew it was true. I just felt in my heart it was true. I didn't want to believe he was dead, but I knew that was true. Nobody let me know that Joe was sick. A few days later, Catherine contacted Joe's sister and brother-in-law, and her worst fears were confirmed. Catherine was stunned to learn that Joe had gone into a coma the very day that she had the first dream about doctors and nurses. He had died of a brain aneurysm just two days before he appeared to Catherine in her dream about the church. You know, somebody should have told me. Well, we didn't know what to do, and even if uh, you went to the funeral, you wouldn't have recognized him. The mortuary put a wig on Joe. His body was so thin, nobody knew him. Well, let me tell you something. Joe came to me in a dream. He came to me in my kitchen and told me himself that he had died. I was convinced that everything I'd tell them, they would tell me, yes, that's the way it was. And when I did tell them, uh, his sister said yes. She said, every detail you've told us, she said, is just the way it was. William Shakespeare once wrote, Today's dream is tomorrow's reality. The cases we've examined tonight certainly seem to support that sentiment, but there is still no logical explanation for psychic dreams. Perhaps this phenomenon will always remain inexplicable and beyond our understanding, truly an unsolved mystery. Next, a serial killer may be stalking the streets of New Orleans. New Orleans, home of the Mardi Gras. The city's heartbeat is its raucous French Quarter, where great music, street celebrations, and Cajun cooking sometimes overshadow a more unsavory side of the city. August 4th, 1991. Across the Mississippi River from the French Quarter, a lone recycler gleaned what he could along a narrow, deserted city road, often used illegally as a dump site. He had no idea he was about to launch one of the city's most complex murder investigations. The body was identified as 17-year-old Danielle Britton, who lived nearby with her mother. She had been strangled and possibly raped approximately 12 hours earlier. At first glance, the murder of Danielle Britton seemed an isolated incident, but the reality was far more sinister. Danielle Britton may have been the victim of a serial killer who preys on women he believes are prostitutes. By some chilling estimates, more than 100 serial killers roam the streets of America at any given moment. Police are usually left to gather clues only from the silent testimony of gruesome crime scenes. But the New Orleans case would be different. Just 10 minutes into the investigation of Danielle Britton's murder, Detective Elizabeth Wigginton had her first inkling that she was dealing with a serial killer. I don't know if it means anything or not, but about two weeks ago... A man approached me regarding an attack of a woman which had occurred approximately two weeks earlier. At this time, I realized that there was a possibility that this attack and the murder of Danielle Britton could be connected somehow, with one striking difference, that this victim survived her attack. It's more scary than anything because I did realize that he assumed that I was dead in order to leave me there. The surviving victim, whom we will call Brenda, had her voice permanently damaged in a strangulation attempt. Police believe she was attacked by the same man who killed Danielle Britton. Brenda, I need for you to tell me as, in as detail as possible what happened that night. When interviewed by Detective Wigginton, 
Brenda was able to recall the trauma in minute detail. I was at my house and I decided that I wanted to go and visit a friend of mine. So I walked up Merrill Street and I noticed that a car was following me. So the man in the car got side by side with me as I was walking and asked me where I was going. I'm just going a few blocks down. I'm okay. And I kept on walking and he kept on insisting that he could give me a ride to wherever I was going. And the car stopped and before I knew it, the man grabbed me and put me into the car. Despite Brenda's protests, the man drove about a half a mile past her friend's house to the same deserted city road where Daniel Britton's body would be found two weeks later. What are you doing? He got on top of me and began to choke me. He looked at me and I looked at him and I realized this man was trying to kill me. So, um... I tried to fight him off, but I really couldn't. I didn't have any strength. The killer strangled Brenda with his bare hands, stripped off her clothes, and dumped her by the side of the road. Six hours later, shortly after dawn, Brenda awoke to find herself covered with garbage and discarded tires. Finding Brenda had certainly been a lucky break in this case. Uh, we had now a live victim who could identify an attacker, an attacker who could be responsible for the murder of Danielle Britton. I knew this guy was out there stalking his victims. He was stalking women, intending to kill them, and I was unable to come up with a suspect. I had no idea it was going to get worse. On September 22, 1991, the killer claimed his third victim, Charlene Price, dumping her body within one mile of the spot where Danielle Britton was found. On December 14th, a fourth victim, as yet unidentified, was found in the same vicinity. This is a sketch of the woman who was in her early 20s. She was five feet, two inches tall, weighed 125 pounds, and had protruding front teeth. Did you touch anything when you got here? Two and a half weeks later, on January 4th, 1992, the killer struck yet again. The nude body of 29-year-old Lydia Madison was found in an illegal dump site under the Greater New Orleans Bridge, eight blocks from police headquarters and 400 yards from the Superdome. Police soon learned that three other bodies had been found in a nearby jurisdiction which borders New Orleans, bringing the total number of victims to eight. These bodies closely resembled bodies found in our investigation in the previous months, leading me to believe that the same killer may be responsible for all these victims. Seven of the eight women were found within a three-mile radius, all but one on the west bank of the Mississippi. The killer has struck once a month, always strangling his victims, always leaving them nude, face down, in or near illegal dump sites. These women have had difficult lives. Uh, they're in vulnerable positions and are at risk to becoming uh, statistics of murders and rapes. I certainly can't do anything about helping them at this point other than trying to find out who killed these victims. And I'm determined to get this guy. I'm still afraid. I don't, I don't run the street at all anymore. I don't go anywhere unless it's to church or if I go to the stores with my mother and somebody accomplishes me because I still don't know where this man is. And I know he knows me just like as well as I know him. So I'm still very much afraid if I'm at home, I stay locked up unless someone else is in the house with me. It's more now like I'm living in fear every minute or every second of the day. On the night she was murdered, Danielle Britton was seen with a suspect outside a bar called Neva's Rendezvous. 
A man was driving a blue late model Buick Regal or Monte Carlo. When we return, a man searched for an anonymous hotline counselor who saved him from the nightmare of drug addiction. Among the unheralded heroes of modern city life, the men and women who answer the urgent calls coming into crisis hotlines. At any moment, a counselor may be plunged into a desperate situation where the fate of a total stranger hangs in the balance. Our next story is a very special mystery about one man's search for the anonymous hotline counselor who reached out and saved his life. Houston, Texas, 1982. James Vernon was strung out again. He had been addicted to heroin since he was 16. On several occasions, James had entered drug treatment programs, but inevitably, he wound up back on the street, still addicted, his life stripped of everything but the daily hustle for a fix. Nothing mattered other than where was my next shot coming from. And that became my life. I mean, it, it's... You speak of careers when you say someone has a career in show business or someone has a career as a doctor. My career was getting my next fix. That was, that was my career. I can remember back in 82, I just fixed and I just done a, a, a load of heroin as it's called. And I was just walking around the streets just trying to figure out what my next move was because I knew that things were getting bad. And I looked up and saw a billboard that said, if you need help, we do care. James felt he had nothing to lose. He called the number and spoke to a woman who identified herself as Libby. Well, what would you like to talk about, James? <laughs> the same old song. I'm lonely and scared and nobody cares. Oh, by the way, I'm a junkie. Oh, by the way, I'm a junkie. OK, let's start with that. I remember her voice being soft and kind and caring. And uh, she didn't talk down to me or, or at me. She talked to me. need to go get some help. And it was uh, the first caring voice I'd heard in a long time that wasn't degrading to me. And she was like letting me know that it wasn't, all of it wasn't my fault, uh, that I, I had a problem and I needed some help, that I, it's not that I was a, a bad person. It was just that I was sick and that I needed some help. Hi, James. What's new? Over the next few months, James called Libby nearly every night. My mother took me back in again. Though he had finally found someone he could trust, this new friendship wasn't enough. James was unable to resist the pull of heroin. In desperation, he stole from his own mother, selling her jewelry to support his habit. Must have really been in bad shape to do something like that. I know it's tough facing up to it, James. I, I tried to make it look like someone else broke into a house, but I, I don't think she bought it. She was really. I remember uh, coming home after it was over, and I knew that my mother was home, and she asked me about it, and she said that all the jury was gone and the window was broke. That I knew anything about it, and, and I lied and said I no, that I had nothing to do with it. Now, you know I wouldn't take your jewelry, Mama. I can't believe somebody would do this. You know, this, this neighborhood ain't like it used to be. But, you know, people just... Two weeks later, and with great reluctance, James's mother threw him out of the house. Something to keep people out. It was just real uh, devastating for both of us, because I had to face up to it then, and I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't admit it. James turned to his ex-wife, who allowed him to move in with her and their two-year-old son. It appeared to be a promising new start. Hi. Wish me luck. I'm thinking, okay, I can do this, okay? I'll pull it back together. I've got my wife back, I've got my son back. I'll get a job, I'll get off the drugs. I'll make it work, you know, I'll do it for them. Hey, baby, guess what? But James wasn't able to do it. He began using drugs again and his ex-wife felt she had no choice but to walk out. There was no note. I, I had no idea where she had gone, where my son was, uh, the furniture, the clothes, the dishes. I mean, everything was gone. 
I think they did it. I was at a point where I just didn't want to live anymore. Like, I just couldn't stand anymore. And uh, I decided that I was going to commit suicide. And I knew how I was going to do it. I was going to just overdose on heroin, just go someplace, sit down, and go out. You know, just, just sleep through it, you know. And then Libby ran across my mind. And I wanted her to know that I really appreciated everything she had done and for sticking with me. But I just couldn't. I just couldn't take no more. I was ready to die. Haven't heard from you in a while. Hope that means you went to get help. Listen, I'm gonna call it a day. I can't take it no more. But I, I wanted to call you and, and thank you for everything. You've been a real good friend. G goodbye. James, let's talk this over. It can't be that bad. I've been living out on the street for the past couple of weeks. And I'm a junkie. Ain't got no money. And you say it's not that bad. Well, maybe it's time you went and got help for yourself. God, James, you have to really. I told her I just didn't want to try no more. And this doesn't have to be the end. And I did the last shot of what I thought would be my last shot of heroin. And it should have been enough to kill at least three people. And uh, I got what's known as a slight rush and a little dizzy. And that was it. I, I even messed that. And I, I remember saying to Libby, she started uh, screaming my name. And I just started laughing. I go, I've even messed this one up, lady. I can't even kill me. And she said, uh, all right, you've tried your way. It didn't work. Let's give my way a shot. Let's go back to treatment. Promise me you will go to treatment. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, come on, James. You have never lied to me before. Now say those words. I'll go to treatment. Okay. I promise. I'll go to treatment. I'd never lied to Libby. She was the only person I hadn't lied to. And I wasn't going to start then. And uh, just something about that voice, that, that carrying, I went, all right, man, you promised her. James Vernon kept his promise. The changes in his life since that evening are nothing short of miraculous. When I say my poor departed wife, I don't want you folks to think my wife is dead. She just got sick of being poor and departed. <laughs> From the brink of self-destruction, James is now confident enough to make his living as a stand-up comedian. Nearly a decade after he last spoke to Libby, he remains drug and alcohol-free. Still going to therapy. I spoke to my therapist last week, and she said my mind was like a bad neighborhood. You should not go in there alone. <laughs> and where's she pulled me out of a spot, man, where I don't think I'd have made it out of without her. Libby, if, if, if you're watching this tonight, uh, please call. And I really want to talk to you. I really want to see you. But I want to give you a hug, and I want to say thanks. You know, uh, it's been a long time, and, it's, it's, and a lot has happened. But you've always been that light. You know, you've always been there. And I want to tell you that. <laughs> Next, a smooth-talking con man steals his victims' affections and then their money. Most con artists play on a basic human instinct, the desire of their victims to make a quick, easy buck. However, the more cunning practitioners of fraud prey not on greed, but on emotion. You're about to meet three women who fell in love with a smooth-talking swindler named J.D. Method. Each discovered the hard way that when it comes to the confidence game, J.D. Method is a master. Well, the new friends. Oh, thank you, J.D. That's so nice. Peggy Peterson, a single mother and businesswoman from the Golden, Colorado area, met J.D. Method in 1990. She had innocently responded to his ad in the personals column of a local no. newspaper. <laughs> Have you ever been in a helicopter? No, no. Oh, it's something I learned in Vietnam. Really? You mm -hmm. were in Vietnam? Mm -hmm. I was a pilot there. J.D. was a very charming person and a nice person and a fun person. 
and um, uh, someone with some professional credentials. Well, you know, David, it really sounds like you like to go to swap meets and flea markets. Linda Weaver, a divorced mother of three, got to know J.D. Method in 1987 through a telephone dating service. After two weeks of phone calls, they began to see each other. He's uh, extremely uh, well-versed in everything. He's, he's witty. Because it's such a fascination of mine. He just knows the answers to just about everything. He's intelligent, and you just enjoy his company. He could talk about any subject. He knows about it, a little bit of everything. In essence, he would interview these women. He would talk to them. He would find out uh, what they were about, their idiosyncrasies, what they liked, what they didn't like, what their style of life was. You know, Peg, I was thinking, you really ought to have a few more credit cards. Whoa, whoa no, I don't need more credit cards. Oh, with credit like yours, you ought to have five. Oh, I hate paying all that interest, J.D. Well, One you know, of the things that we found in our investigation it, was do, Method's ability the, the, to get his victims to extend their credit through the use of credit and cards. And, and not just one, but get a lot of credit cards and even get a lot of the same like kind that. of credit cards. You ought to think about it. Peg, I'd like you to meet Rick. Well, hi, Rick. Hi, Peggy. Nice to meet you. In the case of Peggy Peterson, J.D. spent several weeks carefully baiting his trap until she trusted him implicitly. Especially this guy, he helps me sell him. <laughs> hey, Rick, I noticed that nice looking Camaro over there. What's the story on that one? Oh, J.D., you'll love that. $1,500, private owner. Hold it down for you for $500 down. Oh, is that right? Yeah. See, Peg, there you go. If I had $500 cash, I could buy that car today, sell it tomorrow for $1,000 profit, have 1000 bucks in my pocket. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Hey, what else you got there? Baby? I got a nice clean Z over Hey, honey, here. I'm going to go $3,000. Right. Red interior, automatic. Method worked the scam so well that Peggy made the decision to invest without prompting. I had already survived him doing several car deals over the weeks that we had been dating. So I wrote him out a check for $500. Huh? Excuse me. Uh, J.D., honey, let's just go ahead and get that car. What? Yeah, let's do it. Come on. That'll be a good business deal. Can you believe this woman? <laughs> huh? What am I going to do with you? No, I'm not going to take your money. <laughs> Jay, now, it, and it's not a matter of the money. It's playing the game. And he tore the check up, and he said, I wouldn't take money from you. And uh, I said, so, you know, I mean, check was torn in half. I didn't think anything about it. The very next day, he calls me. Listen, honey, I need your help this afternoon. J.D. told Peggy that his uncle was seriously ill and required immediate surgery. He explained that his funds were tied up with investors and feigned great embarrassment at having to ask Peggy for a loan. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll have it ready for you. I mean, you know, what could I do? I mean, I'd already, I've already committed myself that I could let him have $500. And, you know, what can I do? I can't say, well, yesterday I had $500 to loan you, today I don't. Truck? Yeah, they found the truck. Another victim whom we call Amelia met J.D. in August of 1990. One month later, her son decided to sell his car and buy a pickup truck. J.D. saw his opening and quickly talked his way into the deal. J.D. told Amelia that he could sell the car and for an additional $4,000 could make a great buy on a new pickup. So, you got the title? We do. It's all signed, taken care of. Okay. Okay, you both signed it over to me. That's good. And uh, 4,000 cash? You got it. That's all we need. I told well, him I had some questions about the car and was feeling anxious okay. about the whole Ryan, situation I since I didn't know him very well. He was saying to me, you know, how could I possibly doubt him? Here he is, this honest, caring, wonderful person. Because at some point in the conversation, you know, I had said something to the effect that for all I knew, he could be a con artist. And his immediate response was, Amelia, you could be a con artist for all I know. The end result was that we ended up with no truck and no money and no Mustang at the end of the situation. And that's how it got started. First it was a little amount, and then it would get bigger and then bigger and bigger. And eventually, it would get into the uh, tens of thousands of dollars. Linda, I need your help on this deal now. In the case of Linda Weaver, it was two months before J.D. began to ask for large sums of money. Isn't that good news? Yeah, that's great. I think that's great. But it's going to be three weeks before it gets here. 
Now, we've got to get this business rolling now. So what I'm asking for is a small loan, $15,000, to get this going. I don't have $15,000. Do it for you and me. Now, you know the answer. You can do this for us. OK. Good girl. It happened so fast that I didn't realize what was coming across until afterwards. I'm going, oh, my god. God, what is going on? You know, he was so good. He hit and ran, and he's doing it to all his victims. She is something. Three months after he met Peggy Peterson, J.D. played out the same scene with her. But, uh, listen, dear, I need to, uh, I need to borrow some money from you mm -hmm. to, you know, help me have some cash for the for the trip. Mm -hmm. I need about ninety six hundred bucks. Oh man, that's a lot of money, J.D. Well, I know it seems like it. But that 9,600 is chili beans compared to what my assets are. The His rationale was always that, well, I'm going to pay you back next week. I'll have my money next week. I'll pay you right back. Mm -hmm. That night, uh, you know, I was just sleeping soundly. I was sleeping like a brick. And at 2.30 in the morning, I just sat bolt upright in bed. At, like God had slapped me up the side of the head with a two-by-four and realized what had happened to me. I knew Jerry for 11 months. During that period of time, he, uh, in one way or another, extorted over $70,000. In Amelia's case, J.D. also waited three months before he went for the big money. I don't know about taking the equity out of my home. Well, Amelia, it would only be a short term. Now, if it'd make you feel more comfortable, I've got a promissory note. A promissory note? Yes, it's a legally binding contract that ensures you that I'll pay you back the exact sum. Jerry, I know. The problem with the promissory notes was that J.D. Method would fill out the promissory note backwards. He would make himself the payee, and he would make the victim the maker, so that when you read the promissory note, it said that she owed him $30,000, $40,000, whatever the amount that was involved with that particular victim. By looking at that timeline, what you see is that as, as Mr. Method was starting a relationship, he would either be in the middle or the end of another relationship. I don't believe J.D. Method knows the difference between truth and reality anymore. I think that he has built his life on s lies for so long that he doesn't even know the truth anymore. I think he, he probably believes all of the glop that he shovels off on women. Update. On September 1st, 1992, J.D. Method was apprehended in Beaverton, Oregon, after police were contacted by a woman who lost $2,000 to a man she met through a personals ad in the newspaper. Police staked out the man's home in Beaverton and arrested him when he returned. He was later identified as J.D. Method, Inside Method's house, authorities see several briefcases and a steamer trunk containing papers and documents which may have been used by Method to perpetrate his scams. Next week, Haunting tales in honor of Halloween. During Prohibition, a dramatic love triangle ended in tragedy for a beautiful lady dressed in blue. Some say her ghost still haunts the spot where she and her lover met. And in Wilmington, California, many believe the spirits of the Civil War still roam the Drum Barracks Museum. Join me next time. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Thank you.